Okay. So uh, thanks for thanks for having me. Uh, oh, actually, thanks for having me uh, present today. Um, quick quick background. I've been into uh, 3D photography since about 1990 when I um, attended a wedding and saw somebody with a funny looking camera and asked what it was. And within two weeks, I had bought my first stereo realist, and I was uh, well on my way to owning many stereo cameras. Um, that was in uh, about 1990, and then I didn't become a certified scuba diver until 2004, but quickly it became an obsession and a great, great way to um, relax after uh, working in the city. Uh, and I managed to track down a custom underwater housing for a, a bird low camera, which is in this photo. Uh, bird low, some people uh, may know, is a uh, modified Nimslow camera re-engineered by the British uh, stereographer David Birder. And I was lucky to get my hands on it. And I think uh, almost every photo you will see um, today comes from this camera and pretty simple setup. So uh, I'm going to be presenting with the uh, anaglyphs on top. Um, I tend to prefer black and white, especially since underwater is often very blue. Um, and uh, the, the black and white has a very nice clean anaglyph look. And then at the bottom is the left, right, left stereo uh, pairs for free viewing. Uh, and if, even if you're not free viewing, it gives you a sense of what the colors of the images uh, are. So here is a turtle waking up. And uh, one of the things about diving is you're offering intruding on their spaces. So I was going in and uh, uh, taking some flash photos, and this fellow woke up um, and was not that happy with my uh, my intrusion. But um, it was a nice shot with the uh, with the framing, with the coral, and him tucked inside. So after he woke up, he went to swim away. And one thing about underwater photography when you get involved in it is at the beginning, it's very easy to get lots of shots of fish swimming away from you. So one of the tricks is to manage to turn that around. Here it was a profile, but shows the problem of them you know, starting to move away from you uh, as you as you were swimming around down there. So it's you have to learn to be as calm as possible and let the sea life come to you. Uh, often you'll stay motionless and just wait for things to appear in front of you, um, or you approach very gently. Uh, and here you can also see a lot of times when you're diving either deep or on cloudy days or at night, there's not a lot of light down there so that the uh, strobe will light up here, in this case the turtle, but then the background can often get dark um, and, and provide natural silhouetting. So I didn't alter this at all. This is the way it had come. Uh, these are all uh, scanned from slide film. So here, uh, I just wanted to quickly show, this was me uh, taken by a friend of mine. And I was, I was swimming parallel to the turtle for a long period of time, probably you know 20 feet away, and slowly kind of narrowing the gap as we were swimming in, swimming in the same direction. Because if I swam straight at the turtle, he would have swum away immediately. So I prefaced that image with this one because this was a case of uh, waiting a long time to get this photo. This is a squid, and it's only at about 15 feet deep. And it was taken at the very end of a dive. Now, most dives are roughly around an hour. And the last 10 minutes, you're kind of, you know, you come up to about 15 feet, and you're um, waiting before you can go all the way to the surface. And there were a number of squid who were very skittish in general, they, they will move away from you very quickly. So I was waiting for about 10, 15 minutes as I was um, floating and slowly kind of trying to drift over to get the shot. Um, and just at the last minute, I was getting close and I noticed all the other drivers had already gone up and left the water. Um, I, I figured it was now or never. I moved in quick, shot this, and I would say within a half a second of shooting this photo, the squid was gone. And when we came up, my uh, my wife said, you didn't get it, did you? And I said, I think I did. And I had just got it um, right before it swam away. This is an, a queen angel fish. And you can see the wonderful bright colors. And it's hard sometimes uh, with the daylight, if you're swimming near the top of the water and the lights and during daylight and the light is coming through all the water, it makes everything very blue. 
Um, but that's why sometimes when you're deeper and you're using the flash or it's a night shot, you actually get much more vibrant colors um, because you're not getting all the blue filtered light and you're just getting the, the distance of the light from your strobe to the fish and then back to, to you. So it's a kind of, uh, this is more of a cutout look, but it's, it's, a, it's what we sometimes call a fish ID shot where it's a very clear, clean shot. So it's not always the most um, adventurous or interesting from a, an art perspective, but it's also uh, wonderful to have as documentation of all the different sea creatures you see down there. And as I said, this is a, a queen angelfish. This is a French angelfish, and this is when a uh, more successful attempt of, of getting a fish in a wonderful environment. There's a lot of 3D around. You can see some the blue sea in the background, a little coral up front, some of the, uh, the plants, and the fish is very natural and kind of turning around and, and looking at me. Um, and that, again, just comes with, with practice and um, waiting for the right moment. Uh, the camera I use, the, the Birdlow, is very, um, it has a fixed focal point and the flash is set so that the strobe is set. So it's about four feet in front of the camera. Um, so while it has um, limitations, it's also convenient in the, in the sense that you're not wondering about fiddling with the camera and changing settings, you're just working within these limitations, but it allows you to just focus on um, the life around you and finding the right shot. This is a crab uh, in its home. Um, and again, these since I mentioned and you saw the rig has the one strobe light, uh, it's tricky sometimes to get the light to be at the right angle because you'll be approaching things from different uh, angles and you'll have to make sure that the strobe can get in without casting uh, too many strange shadows um, but you're also the creatures moving you're floating uh, there are a lot of things to deal with at the same time and one habit i had to get out of was as a photographer i was taught that you hold your breath and stay as still as possible when shooting a, a picture on land but when you're uh, in the water if you hold your breath, you will immediately start rising up. So when I first went to shoot underwater photography, I would go and get set up to take a picture, hold my breath, and suddenly I'd be wondering why I was drifting way, way above the subject. So I had to uh, unlearn that and learn to actually exhale while I was shooting. But this one, uh, this one worked out pretty well. Here's another crab. And this one, uh, unlike the organic home we just saw, this crab found its home uh, in a, this is a propeller shaft from a sunken wreck. And this crab pretty much lived there. We went on multiple dives in this location. And when taking a, a picture like this, uh, as I said, I'm moving, the crab's moving. Um, I, I took many passes past the, the hole to, to try different angles, to have the flash in slightly different settings before I could get the right, um, have it all work out properly. Um, and then I came back on another dive and the crab was still there with a with a, just a 2D digital camera to get a nice shot for a crisp uh, print. But the, the focus, as I mentioned, is, is fixed and the crab's in focus, but the um, tube, which was the closest to me, gets a little out of focus, but it kind of is okay and pulls the attention into the, uh, to the crab. Of course, crab aren't the only crustaceans. Uh, so there are a lot of lo lobster, especially here in the, in the Caribbean. And, well, not here in the Caribbean, but Caribbean is what diving, uh, a lot of New Yorkers dive because it's such a close, easy trip. And here, the lobster is at home. They often retreat into their homes if they see you coming, but will keep an eye on you and can often provide some good 3D opportunities with the, the surrounding coral. Um, this image also shows another one of the tricks of underwater photography, which is there can be backscatter. And also here you can see, I don't know how clearly it can be seen. It can be seen clearly in the original slides. I'm not sure about in the, um, uh, in the, uh, on the computer screen, but there are little tiny fish that were swimming past. Um, so often things get in the way of, of your subject. Um, things are, um, if you swim fast or if you touch sand that, that kicks up and creates backscatter. So, and that, especially if that's close to the camera lens and you set off the strobe, you get very bright spots in front of the photo that can, can ruin an image. 
This is uh, an interesting little creature. This is a slipper lobster that was taken during a night dive. And um, one of the general rules of thumb of, of dive photography is not to shoot down. When you're floating, as in kind of the swimming position, it's, it's tempting to look down at the bottom and shoot. But then you get a lot of these overhead shots. Fish often um, will you know, be swimming naturally, and then you'll just see lines. So in general, you don't shoot straight down as much. But here, uh, it captured the, the uh, slipper lobster and its shape, since it's so thin and flat to the ground. Uh, it, was a, it was a better angle for this image. This is a trumpet fish. And one of the wonderful things about diving is all the different variety of shapes and sizes, colors, behaviors of the sea creatures down there. And trumpet fish are pretty common, and they Actually, when you're, if you start uh, following one, they will often try to um, go into some plants and they tip up on their noses and become vertical and try to imitate um, the plant life down there to disguise themselves. Here he's out in the open and with a nice contrast of color with the background. This is a smooth trunk fish and sometimes um, the setting can be as interesting or especially in 3D, as, as dynamic as, as a subject. And uh, this made an attractive image with the small, smooth trunk fish next to this very 3D uh, finger coral uh, next to it. This is a black tip reef shark. And uh, not the most uh, 3D in terms of dramatic 3D, but it does provide a nice sense of volume when, when you view it um, and you get the sense of the shark and being close to one. Um, and it also provides an opportunity to talk about uh, how sharks are really not, you know, despite Shark Week and all the shark attack uh, promos they pull, uh, sharks really um, don't care much about you when you're in the water. They go, they go right past. And the first time I ever did a shark dive, I remember looking down and seeing about 20 divers in the water, sorry, about 20 sharks, and like five divers in the water, and the sharks were just swimming around, and I looked down and I said, well, I, if, uh, if the other divers are okay, I guess I can do it too. The first time, it takes you a little courage to step down when you see them all. But once you go down, you realize that they're really not interested. Um, they're beautiful creatures to watch and, um, and document. Another cool sea creature is the octopus. These are often harder to spot, both because they camouflage so well and because they're nocturnal, so you, you normally have to go on night dives if you want to see them, although I have seen some during the day as well. Um, the um, octopus here was trying to camouflage, and you can see he tucked all the tentacles underneath to um, better impersonate some lumps of coral on the bottom. And this is one thing I love about 3D photography is this, this image works much better when you can see it in 3D and brings the octopus shape to life uh, flat. It wouldn't be as interesting, but when you get to see that it brings out the, the octopus shape. And uh, anybody interested in octopus, I'm sure uh, um, my octopus teacher on Netflix, a documentary about uh, a diver's relationship with a, with a uh, octopus is, um, has been very popular and I recommend it's a very interesting documentary to watch. Um, you don't only run into sea creatures down there. Uh, as most people know, um, you almost always go diving with a dive buddy. And it's uh, sometimes fun to turn the camera on the divers down there and, and document that experience as well. And here was uh, my friend Julia, who was on a dive with me. Um, and uh, give him the thumbs up. This is a porcupine fish, and again, it, it shows the, the challenge of, of finding the right angle with the right flash and, and in the right moment. Um, and the, um, this image worked out while I was waiting to, uh, for, the, for the fish to get curious. He had, he had gone in and then came back out a little bit to take a peek to see if I was still there, and I, and I caught the moment. Um, and, and the coral, again, serves as a nice framing. And while you don't want to repeat the same image all the time, each animal is different, and um, there's some conventions that, are, um, that work well. And um, again, this 
when they're they, the creatures often will hide amongst the coral and can make some nice uh, compositions. And speaking of camouflage, this is a scorpion fish that can be very hard to spot. Um, here you can see it in the center of the uh, of the image, and they're very poisonous. And I was on a dive once with a diver who um, sometimes photographers, underwater photographers, will use a finger to just gently touch a piece of coral or something to rest to just steady themselves while they're they're taking an image. And a diver was doing that, and their buddy frantically waved to point out that they were about to put their finger on top of the scorpion fish, which is, uh, I said, can be can be very poisonous. So you want to look out. And the best rule of thumb is not to touch anything while you're down there. Um, but uh, always always be aware um, of what, what life is, where life is. This is an eel. And it also uh, happened to come out at the nice moment where there was a parade of fish swimming past uh, and they will often kind of come out a little bit and if you look carefully there's also a shrimp that's on the underside of the coral right to the left of the uh, of the eel uh, and that's often where you'll find the shrimp hanging out and uh, they um, they can strike fast and they're actually been known when divers go in to take uh, photos sometimes you have to be careful because they will come out and they'll sometimes if your camera's in front of you They'll sometimes come out and strike the front of the camera um, Not not most of the time, but if you get too close you have to be aware of that and they're lightning fast when they do something like that This is a profile shot of another uh, spotted moray eel and Eel when you're watching them will rhythmically open and close their mouths uh, frequently which forces water over the uh, internal gill chamber and allows them to breathe. So um, when I first went down, I thought I was wondering if they were nervous or they were being, um, it was something about being uh, scared about uh, uh, a bigger creature approaching, but it turns out that they, um, they always do that. And that's just a way um, of keeping the, keeping them breathing. This is a uh, sweet lips, is the name of the fish. It's a very bright fish. Here you can see the yellow, there's purple, blues, the, and even in, red in the gills. And this was a, a fun shot because it's wonderful to capture some moments of their behavior. And here, the little fish can be seen going into the gills. And this was a cleaning station where larger fish would come, swim up, and the smaller fish would go in and clean the fish. And then after a while, that fish would leave and another fish would come in. Um, so it was a good place to hang out and, and get some photos. And again, um, you know, rules are meant to be broken. In, in general, it's nice to get the face of the fish not coming, but here it was a wonderful angle to see the, the fish going into the gills and cleaning them out. This is a map puffer fish uh, and an unusual fish. Um, and you can see again, it's 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 wonderful wonderful just to go down and see all the different shapes and sizes and patterns. And I always say it, it's uh, it looks like an artist having fun, just deciding to create different colors and shapes. And what would happen if I put stripes on this? And what happens if I make this translucent and have it light up? And here the map puff, uh, the map puffer was was just underneath a little bit of orange coral and hanging out nicely for me to to capture. And then finishing up, this is the um, this is a lionfish, and this was the only shot uh, today that was not taken with the um, bird low nymph low. It was uh, taken with a W1, a Fuji W1 with an underwater housing um, that I took, and it was a shallow dive, so there was there was good light, and I had to silhouette out the background because of this close up. The background was uh, very distracting, so I did a quick. Um, silhouette job um, so that you can see this very 3D subject. Uh, and lionfish are beautiful, but they're um, they're an invasive species in the in the Caribbean, um, and they're they're not native to Atlantic waters, and they have few predators. So when they show up, they end up throwing the ecosystem out of balance, and they will get populated um, populate the area rather quickly. So uh, some dive shops have now trained divers on how to safely um, kill them 
um, and will actually encourage the rare rare time where divers are encouraged to do so because um, they are kind of running out of control uh, in the Caribbean these days. Uh, and that is the last image. So let me see if I have the. Uh, oh, that's going. I don't know why that's down. Oh well. Okay. So that was. The last image. Thank you very much for listening and viewing. That was great, Ted. Those were fantastic. Thank you. Pretty wonderful. So much fun to go down and, and, and see them. And, and um, there's always a, a tension between um, taking the photos and experiencing the dive, just like any, you know, I mean, that's always the, the photographer's battle of experiencing the moments versus capturing the moment. Um, so there are dives I go down without a camera, but of course, when you do that, of course, you see something and you're like, I wish I had my camera. Um, but uh, the flip side is, even though it sometimes interferes with the moment, um, it's, I, I guess I'm, I'm above water way more often than I'm below water. So it's, I love being able to, to pick up the slides and, and relive those moments and, and look and look careful closely at these creatures. So I find it still the benefit. The trick with the uh, uh, bird low, which is right here, I'll show. This is the uh, this is the camera actually that took most of the the shots there. Um, the trick is that it's a film camera, so I can't. I have an X amount of shots that I have to use down there. Um, if I run out and something wonderful comes by. I just you know wave at it and, and 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 I'm sorry. So I always try to save some shots, but then at the same time, if you're saving shots and then nothing comes, then you come out. You feel like I, I could have taken all these shots. So there's always a balancing act when you're having to choose what what to shoot um, and what to let go by. And you're also guessing at you know if you captured the image that you wanted. Like with that squid, I had no idea until I until I uh, got the film back and was very happy that I had caught it the split second before it, it ran away. But I don't know if there are any other questions or. Yeah, I saw a question um, here in the chat from Jay. I don't know if you want me to just read it, Jay, or you want to ask it. I'll... Oh. oh, there. Have you put the 3D camera in ROV? I have not. Um, I've been, um, uh, yeah, so far I've just, you know, I've done, when I've done my recreational diving, I've just grabbed the uh, housing and gone down. Um, and, and it's been, and that's been about it. And then I said, I tried the W1. Um, because it's obviously a, a less bulky and, and digital and I wouldn't be limited to shots, but it just wasn't wasn't up to taking a lot of shots down there. If it was very shallow and like I, said, I got that line fish shot, that was kind of nice, but um, didn't work out so well. Um, so I pretty much just used the bird low. And uh, I'm, I'm going to give a shout out to Mark Blum, who the, uh, some may know is the photographer, um, is an underwater photographer and stereo photographer. He had a few books out on, on different animals and one of them is um, uh, at least, at least one. I think more are underwater photo books. Um, and uh, I asked him where I could get a camera, and he happened to be selling his one of his rigs, so that worked out well for me and for him, I guess. Um, and uh, yeah, he does great work. If you're interested in seeing more work like this, nice. I have a question of um, what was the name of that documentary that you mentioned? Oh, it's uh, called My Octopus Creature. Um, and it's on Netflix, and it's a full-length documentary about uh, a guy who went diving. Um, I'm trying to remember now whether it was uh, in South Africa, I believe. Um, he went diving every day uh, in the same place and got to know a, an octopus, um, and they, who ends up becoming um, comfortable with him and would literally come up and sit on his chest. Um, and he experiences this whole uh, year span because octopuses live about a year, so he experiences the whole lifespan with this octopus and it's a good documentary just about our relationship with nature and 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 um with these these creatures and octopus specifically are, are very intelligent so a good uh, i think it's one of few awards it's a good good documentary cool. any other questions for ted we, we still have a few minutes yeah, yeah. Um, i'm sorry go ahead okay uh you mentioned the uh the issue of of blue blue light, which I'm assuming gets more intense the lower you go, is it possible? actually the opposite. Because when you're when you're when the light is coming, well, 
when the light's coming through, it's going passing through all the water and you're getting all this light and all this blue filtered light. When you get down and it's dark, then you're only getting the, the strobe and the light's just going from your strobe to the fish and back. It's passing through less water and you actually get much better colors. So it's, it's funny. When you're really shallow, you can get better colors or when you're deep or it's a night dive. I always talk about night dives as going to the movies because you have like the bright light, everything's dark, you're shining a bright light and you get much more vibrant colors than you get during the day. When you're diving during the day, everything looks blue. When you're diving at night and you're using a bright light on things, you see the real colors. Uh, I was just wondering if you could cancel out the blues if they were annoying you with warming filters. Yeah, I, there are, there is a, um, you know, the bird low has screws on it for attaching lenses or filters on the, on the front. But um, I haven't, I, I don't, I'm not even seeing myself here, so I got there we go. Um, but I haven't, I haven't uh, attempted to do that. There were enough tricks in getting the light, and I, I figured out the right strobe setting and the right distance and the right things. Um, and actually, like um, most of the, and if you saw at the bottom in the preview, most of the colors come out pretty well. There were some the squid, and there's some that um, that get very blue. But um, most of the time, when I'm within four feet and using the strobe, I can get some decent colors. Yeah, probably. I'm not a big tech photographer, so. I'm sure there are, there are people who probably, I'm sure Mark probably, when he's doing his books, has, would be the one to go to on advice on how to, how to do that. Well, if I can interject, um, the problem is if you put a filter on, all it does is cut down the blue light to try to balance it so it looks daylight. So you end up cutting up a tremendous yeah. amount of light. And it's impossible to get an exposure. So it's way easier to take a bluish exposure and then try to rebalance it when you get it on the computer because at least you've got an exposure. Yeah, I was going to say, most a lot of the slides look nice and they're crisp. And then the, a lot of the images you saw today, I did pull out the colors and they all had more blue cast and I was able to, you know, bring them into into sharper uh, folks and brighter colors and better contrast because it also will be, it'll be hazy. It won't be, the contrast won't be as great. Um, so sometimes you can you can make them pop a little bit more in Photoshop. Uh, my my dad was an Eastman Kodak engineer. He insisted I learn photography to to get it right in camera. So before the digital age, really. Um, yeah, well, like most of what I'm shooting is film, so <laughs> so I I can scan it and mess around with it, but I, I still love looking at the slides the best. What, one one other question: because you uh, uh, lived in Brooklyn in the eighties. Uh, did you ever go diving in the Coney Island Creek to find that submarine? <laughs> I didn't. I wasn't a diver until uh, 2004, so I did not. But um, I have. I have gone diving in Maine. I don't think any of the photos today were from Maine, but I have gone diving in Maine. It's freezing, but it's uh, and you see a lot of what you'd expect—a lot of lobster and crab. Um, but uh, and it was fun. It's fun to experience diving in different locations and see the different different sea life. The visibility is really low when I was in Maine, so you'd see like a uh, um, I forget what it was a seal or sea lions that what you just see these shadows and then they'd be curious and come in so it would be like you wouldn't really see anything then this murky shape and then they would be right there and then gone so it was a whole different experience than when you're in the Caribbean and you can see you know as far as you can look in any direction in 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 uh, clear waters um, but uh, yeah it's fun I would I wouldn't be against I I say I, I dive in a bathtub and have a good time so I like to try uh, going going in, in anywhere that the opportunity arises. I have a question about uh, the camera. Um, oh, do you mainly use uh, ASA 100 film? Uh, yeah. 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 We used to sell, we sold the Burlows for David Berger in the USA. And uh, I used it above ground a lot. It was a great for great for portraits. And uh, could you remind me, what is the distance you focus underwater? About four feet. Have you ever tried, uh, I found above ground, uh, it was a great portrait camera with a plus one lens screwed onto that, onto the right. 72 millimeter filters. And that focuses at about two feet above ground. And have you ever tried the plus lens underwater? I have not tried the plus lens underwater. I was kind of working on getting used to the distance and the flash and um, yeah, it's I haven't done enough. And, and, and when I started getting some nice results, I said, you know, I got kind of what works and it's hard with the backgrounds too. I would, I would find it, well, one is it's hard getting that close sometimes because, like I said, the, the creatures tend to want to, to go away. Um, and the other is that with the backgrounds, like I said, with the lionfish, when you get close into a portrait, sometimes the backgrounds can get very 
um, lots of well, the, well, the results you got, uh, those are just fantastic. And uh, you've, you've really optimized what's possible with that camera setup. It's really Thank great. You. Thank you very much. And that's, and, and I find it like at first I was like, oh, it's kind of limiting. But then when I started using it, I'm like, well, it actually, you get used to, you get into a certain zone and, um, and it's nice. I, I do, I did get a macro camera that I, uh, for underwater that I never uh, haven't used yet that I would love to start doing because I have a um, stereo macro list for, for land use, which I've used um, and really enjoyed using. So I do have uh, one, but I haven't, that would hopefully be a future show because I haven't used it, but uh, hopefully at some point. So it's it's the uh, stereo realist macro or the David Berger macro. No, I, have, I have the. I have the uh, it's uh, um, It was um, a large. It's a large format. Oh, okay. Um, so we'll see. Hopefully, hopefully I'll I'll dive again someday. <laughs> I don't understand. Why didn't you like the uh, the W one in an underwater housing? It just it didn't. Um, it was it just didn't seem to perform as well uh, in terms of. Uh, getting the strobe and the light and to work. It just it didn't seem to capture the images as well. I tried it a number of times um, and the the nature of one of the best things about the film too is I know you can you can change set the, with the digital to, to manual settings and um, take off the the uh, autofocus and that, but with the film camera when you press the button boom <laughs> I got that moment and um I never quite got that same with the digital. So, and, and that's, I'd say one of the most important things when I'm taking these photos is knowing when to press the shutter. If you press it too early and you haven't quite got the image you want or the angle you want and all of that. Um, and as I said, you're you're wasting film if, if you don't get what you want down there and you only have X num number of shots. Um, at the same time, if you wait too long, you know, which I've done, you everything breaks apart and, you know, a diver swims by, another fish comes, something kicks up, the subject goes away and, you know, so it's, is waiting for that right moment and and make and 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 also of course the strobe recharges. So sometimes you can shoot and then you the strobe if the battery's not at full power and the strobe's taking a few seconds to recharge, you can miss something. So, yeah. For for those who are uh, less familiar with film or those cameras, you didn't mention the quantity, but the bird low, uh, with a thirty six shot roll of film, you get eighteen stereos. So that's how many shots he can get before he has to get above water and reload. So. Yeah. It's well, pretty limiting when you're used to digital, where you've you're unlimited, <laughs> almost. That's, that's what I was about to ask is if you have to surface every time you change your film roll, doesn't it take? I've got an uncle who dives. It takes um, an hour to surface, right? Because you gotta you gotta go up in stages or whatever. Well, it doesn't take an hour. Normally, it depends how deep you go. Normally, on dives where you're going above 100 feet, so you're going anywhere from you know 20 to 80 feet, about. Um, those dives normally last about an hour. You do a little longer, but of course, you know, 10 minutes or so of that is getting in and 10 minutes is like coming back out. So you have roughly a half hour or so to, to be actively shooting. Um, although, like I said, with the squid, and I, I have taken shots during those last 15 minutes where you happen to be standing still and things might come around. But normally it's during the meat of the dive, which is about a half hour. Um, and then you have to come up, yeah. And then you have to be up, you know, on land again for an hour or two before you go go in again. Um, but sometimes, you know, and sometimes I would shoot. Uh, there'd be something, and I would take a lot of photos up front. But then it would be like, okay, well, I'm done with the photography part, and I just go enjoy the rest of the dive, uh, and and forget about the photography part. And like I said, sometimes I would force myself to leave the camera just to go and, and be more zen and meditative and just enjoy the dive, but um, and hope that nothing too good came by. <laughs> Would it be possible? Could you post a, a picture or two of your camera rig that we could see, maybe for the Brooklyn site? Yeah, sure. It's a it's a very antique looking tech. I think it was fairly old when Mark had it, and then I got it from Mark yeah. in like two thousand five or something. It's, it's, it's probably we had one at one time. It was made by Icolite, and uh, I did one dive with it. I'm not. I never became an active diver, so I had one Catalina dive, and that was it. Uh, and then we sold it, <laughs> and I don't remember who got it. It might end up being, it might have ended up with Mark Blum, and now it's with you. I don't know. <laughs> could be a good write up for the um, stereo site uh, dot com, and we'll let you guys know if we um, or when we add something from Ted there. I, I think Ted mentioned we were talking earlier that he does have a site coming that he'll be updating. Um, so we'll definitely let everybody know when that's available. 
Um, I want to ask, um, I'm going to reserve the last question for me. If you guys have any other questions, please put them in the chat and we'll catch them at the end after our next presenter. But I'm going to ask Ted one last question, a really quick one, if it's off the top of your head. It's not about um, 3D or 3D photography at all. Um, is there one, one creature that got away from you that you still oh, have away. middle of the night? One thing that's I it would have been the squid if I hadn't got it because that was I uh, I tried many times and I finally got that one. Um, one thing that's frustrating is size because you're four feet away. So like I, I have photos I took with my normal camera with a flat you know two D digital of manta rays and things that I've seen that you just can't capture. I can't capture with that my, that rig in three D. So there's some larger creatures. Like you saw the shark was a bit larger and I got the head and you know, you can kind of do a little bit, but some of the larger creatures like mantas and other, I wish I could capture in 3D and I just, I could, I guess I would just have to <laughs> get a, get a different rig to do it. Um, so that's, that's probably that. Other than that, I don't think there's anything that leaps to mind that, um, you know, they're always, they're, you know, every dive I say there's something that I like don't get the right angle or can't. Um, get exactly as I, as I would like, but um, I, I look at it more as I'm happy with what I get. Anytime I get anything, uh, you know, when, I, when something comes, I look and I see I got the flash was right and I got the crab at the right angle and I can see through the hole and I'm, you know, I'm, I'm still like a little kid every time I see the uh, come back and, um, you know, with film, especially when you have that wait till you process it and you look, um, I always get excited when I, you know, the, the percentage is still low in, in the ones that work out versus the ones that don't, but it's it's worth it for the ones that do. Cool. So thank you very much.